My name is Anne Stewart, spelled S-T-U-A-R-T. <laughs> I'm presently at uh, uh, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, but recently retired from my position there, where I was a professor. I went to Swarthmore College um, as, uh, as uh, undergrad, where I heard about the MBL for the first time from H. Keffer Hartline, uh, who had two sons there, and I was you know, privileged to actually hear him give a seminar. He's one of MBL's Nobel laureates. Um, and I was smitten, completely smitten at the time. So I went to Swarthmore, and then I was uh, a, uh, in graduate school at Yale, and then did a postdoc at Harvard and another postdoc at UCLA, and then came back to Harvard as an assistant professor until 1979 when I became a uh, faculty at Chapel Hill. That it's worth my, I heard, I heard a seminar by Keffer Hartline. Absolutely fascinating. I was, I was just captured uh, and I, I had to go see the MBL. It seemed like it had to happen. So the minute I graduated and my grandparents gave me a, a very nice little car for my graduation present from Swarthmore, I got in the car and I drove to the MBL. I had, I didn't know what I was doing, you know, I came here, I found somebody that I had known that had been at Swarthmore and I asked if I could sleep on their floor and the person said yes. And I just, um, I just came, right? So that was in 1965. Then in 1968, my advisor actually came here for the summer, so I came as a graduate student in, in his lab. And then in 1973, when I was first as an assistant professor, I started coming here, funded by, by my own grants as a PI, to study barnacles. Seemed like a good thing to study here. Uh, when I was six, <laughs> And I've often puzzled, puzzled about why I was interested so early. I think one of the reasons was that I had a female pediatrician, and it seemed like that was the only thing that you could do as a woman, was to become a doctor. So I decided when I was six that I would become a doctor. And then um, I, that went on until actually uh, Swarthmore, where I, um, I had planned on, I was, I was pre-med, so I planned to become a doctor. but. Along the way, I did a lot of research, scientific research problems. I had, you know, science fair projects, some of which I'm ha happy to say won prizes and got me to go places. And I volunteered in the lab at the hospital after I decided that the floors were not for me. And slowly I realized I was not a doctor, I was a researcher. I come from a business background. Uh, my mother was very, very supportive. My father just totally perplexed uh, and perhaps a little bit against it. And, um, but my mother was great. She dragged me all over the place where, when I was doing my science projects and I became a ham radio operator when I was 12. She helped me <clears throat> by dragging me out to ham functions and everything, she was wonderful. It was very hard for a woman to find any mentors. I had my beloved pediatrician, but now that was, you know, a doctor. Um, I had no female role models to help me along. Well, Swarthmore College is a Quaker school. It's from the very beginning had believed in 50-50 gender, gender education. Um, so I never thought in terms of um, <laughs> I, I only saw myself as a budding scientist taking my courses and going on to graduate school and so forth. Would you like to know what happened next? I applied, so, so I went to a, one of these wonderful summer programs for scientists um, span, sponsored by, for, for undergraduates, sponsored by the NSF, and became very interested in slime molds, which are a marvelous developmental uh, biology system and problem. And there was a, a man, at, uh, a professor at Princeton named uh, John Tyler Bonner. So I decided I wanted to go do my PhD work with him. So I wrote Princeton for an application and they wrote back that they didn't take women. 
And I thought, well, this can't be. <laughs> Maybe in the undergraduate school, but in the graduate school, this just can't be right. So I um, got a, a male friend at Princeton to send me an application, and I filled it out and sent it in. And then I called Bonner, and I said that I was quite interested in working, doing my PhD with him, and that I had had this response from Princeton. It couldn't be right. Could I please come down and interview? Well, he was a wonderful man. Uh, and recently, I actually contacted him again. He was still alive, and I thanked him for all of this. So I went down to interview, and he was wonderful. The only problem was nobody else in the whole department was friendly towards me, including someone who <laughs> ended up living on the same road as I live on here at Lilly Road, uh, Bob Allen, who was at the time director of graduate studies and told me that Princeton would take, it would take Princeton $100,000 to train a PhD, so they weren't going to invest that in women because they would just leave and have babies. And I tried to tell this man that I had been planning to be a scientist since I was six, and I wasn't going to leave and have babies, but it didn't do any good. That was so much to my surprise, coming out of Swarthmore, which was so egalitarian, I had started to hit the brick wall. Um, and there were multiple instances of that over the next few years until Title IX in 1972, which suddenly, I mean, everybody thinks of Title IX as being uh, liberating women athletically, but Title IX liberated us women in science by making it, if, if you were funded by the federal government, you had to give equal opportunity. And it was amazing what happened. It was night and day. Uh, well, before 1972, uh, I, you know, I would, it would take me an hour to list all the instances of trouble that I had. And after 1972, Suddenly, and well, it helped that I had a good PhD thesis, uh, but suddenly everybody was uh, making job offers to me. It was uh, quite extraordinary. I went to Yale, <laughs> where another uh, resident of Lily Road, where I live up here in, uh, in Woods Hole, um, it was also troublesome, Trinkus. So he was director of graduate studies and he wouldn't let me apply for the physiology course here. I was, at, I was accepted as a graduate student and, um, but I was not allowed to apply for the physiology course. So then I transferred departments at Yale from the biology department where he was and a bunch of other who I considered people that I didn't want to do my PhD with. I transferred over to the physiology department at Yale in the medical school uh, that had lots, a, a whole cadre of neurobiologists, all of whom were doing interesting work. And at that point, I completely dedicated myself to being a neurobiologist and not a developmental biologist. So I always thought that because I was an amateur radio operator at the age of 12 and put together my equipment and everything, there was something in me that just liked to play with all these gadgets that neuro neurophysiologists use, oscilloscopes and stimulators and all that sort of stuff. I loved it. <laughs> so for a long time I studied vision in invertebrates and I, and I studied vision in um, the giant barnacle in particular. So actually, that giant barnacle is a resident of the West Coast, not of here. Uh, although we study here, we have a barnacle species that's also studied. But that particular species was more favorable for what I wanted to do. So I would have it. I would have barnacles, 50 or 100 at a time, flown here, uh, pick them up, and put them in the seawater system. And then I had to put a filter on the outflow so that any larvae that would come from my barnacles would not escape to the East Coast and start transferring that species to the East Coast. They were very adamant about that at one point here in the, uh, yeah, uh, in the marine research resources place. So I studied vision, um, I studied the photoreceptor synapses and their, the transfer of the signal from the, from the photoreceptors to the second and third order cells. So, much, much of the work got actually done here because it's so much easier to do experiments here. It's just amazing. So I would, you know, work here for four months and get all the experiments done and then go home and write the papers and 
do the write the grants and do the homework to prepare for the next season. And we we would do some experiments there, but the the most of what actually got done um, got done in those amazing late night <laughs> stays in the lab here, night after night after night, just getting stuff done. I actually continued that research all the way up until the uh, early 90s. I can't remember exactly when, but uh, when I realized that I had to move to Drosophila really to s solve the problems that I was trying to solve. But <laughs> maybe it was the late 90s. <laughs> um, at some point I moved to Drosophila, but I was not happy moving to Drosophila and I finally decided to close my lab and turn my attention to other things. So the MBL for a neurophysiologist is heaven. It's just heaven. You come here and you can immerse yourself in the lectures of the courses and there are two of them. You know, I would come here and after I got my research going and I had postdocs and students that could carry it on so that I was free to do a few other things, I would go to all the neurobiology lectures for those three, every morning, for the, those three hour lectures that happen in the morning from nine to 12, I would sit there and catch up in my field. And then I would go to the, to the seminars at night, the Monday night neuro seminar, the Wednesday night NSMB seminar, you know, and then of course there are other occasional seminars that happen here or there, then came the imaging seminars. For a neuroscientist, this is absolutely heaven. And uh, so I felt, I just felt that I had, it's like, a, it's like going to a, the Society for Neuroscience meeting, which lasts for what, five days? It's like going to that for three months, you know, and just, and, uh, this is where I, um, every year, felt rejuvenated and got my ideas all straightened out. I'm very proud of, along with Chris Cousins and um, Cynthia Rollins, of having started the Satellite Club. Very, very proud of that because it took a huge amount of work. It hu took an enormous amount of diplomacy and Joan Ruderman joined in that too. She, she wasn't in the initial group of three. But after it had been going for a year, she became president of the combined children's co-ops, uh, well, the, the Periwinkle and Satellite combined. And then she was in the fray. And um, it took some hard work and a lot of time. And to have it work and be, still be going, I'm very proud of that. How many women were here doing science in the 70s? Hardly anybody, and, or even the early 80s. And one of the reasons was there wasn't any place to put your child to, and be comfortable that they were safe and that they were having a good time. And so people would try to bring babysitters down, but then if you didn't have an extra room in your house um, or you didn't have enough wherewithal, that was not so easy. Um, in fact, when my son was just a baby, we brought a babysitter, and that babysitter actually also shared babysitting responsibilities for John Dowling's kid and lived out at the Dowling's. So it was these sorts of informal relationships that um, had to be made, and it were very not very welcoming of, you know, it's hard enough to come here. You have to pack up all your stuff. You have to make sure that you've got all the bits. Uh, that takes a long time. Um, you have to f do something with your home that's, that you're leaving, you know, have a house sitter or somebody or other. You have to have people come with you to help out and they have to go through all this and rent out their place or whatever and bring their family. It's just a big project to come here. And then the additional problem of not having care for your child uh, it was almost, it just w was very discouraging of women to come here and work. So we wanted to fix that. So in 1968 when I came, people were still eating in the old dining hall. You've probably heard about that, which is where the ecosystems 
uh, part of that is now. So you would line up to get into, into the old dining hall. You would line up and uh, everybody would be in line and they'd be talking to each other. And it was right beside the tennis courts. And usually Andrew St. Georgie, who thank goodness is still alive and there was just a symposium for him. He was out there whipping the pants off of young guys that would challenge him and he would always win at tennis. And of course the scientists all lined up for dinner would be standing there and cheering him on. <laughs> So that was kind of fun. Um, I loved the library in those days before the air conditioning. So when you come into the library, all the windows were open and there was this gentle breeze blowing through and you could hear the eel pond boats, the rigging kind of going clunk, 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 clunk. And I just loved going up to the top floor and picking my desk. It wasn't really my desk, but I took a desk over by the, the, eel, pond, uh, the eel pond window and sitting there in that lovely, lovely air, and I was somewhat sorry when they air conditioned the library, although I suppose it's necessary for the books. So I loved that part very much, and remember that. Well, we stayed in Lily along with a couple of other families that, because we wanted to rescue the books from the, from the basement should the water start pouring in. So that was our reason for staying. Um, although another reason for staying was it was just exciting. <laughs> so, um, and we felt, we figured, look, this building's not gonna go anywhere in a hurricane, right? So we're probably fine, which we were. Afterwards was really interesting. So um, one of the interesting things was that so much vegetation was down and, or, or the leaves were compromised by the salt that the wasps and bees were disrupted. And there was a terrible plague of wasps and bees everywhere. And Falmouth Hospital had to open a whole piece of the hospital as an emergency room for wasps and bee stings. Uh, something that one doesn't normally think about, but when you're living out in the trees, um, yeah, this, is a, this was really something else. Swope fed the community for days and days and days, because as I remember it, we didn't get power back for 10 days. So Swope just fed everybody from everywhere around, which was wonderful. There was, for people who hadn't thought about the fact that they didn't have much gas in their car, this was not a very good thing, because no gas stations could pump gas because there was no electricity. So people who didn't have, who maybe wanted to leave, um, or even leave temporarily and come, you know, it was like difficult. Um, you've probably seen pictures, well, on the DVD is a picture of Surf Drive completely lifted up and moved over <laughs> and so that it was put down on top of rocks and it's just decimated. But uh, I think the dirt, just the continual mud and dirt and wasps and bees and all that was um, quite something when you were living out, out in the trees. When I came here as a PI in 73, I was so focused on getting my own lab going. I didn't want to teach at all in any of the courses. I had enough of that at, in the winter. I just wanted to get my lab really, really going. And so and so I remember in 73 and in 74, the first two years I was here, I gave myself one morning a week off from the lab, Sunday morning, to go swimming. And the whole rest of the time, morning, afternoon, and night was in the lab to get things going and get things working properly. So, <laughs> I, and I had, you know, I think, I'm trying to remember who I brought down, I, uh, but I would bring, I think the first year I didn't bring anybody. I was advised by Ed Kravitz. Ah, Ed Kravitz was certainly a wonderful mentor for me, starting uh, he, and he was part of the Harvard group. So starting in 19, in the, in the late 60s, he, 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 I guess, is my mentor. Okay, so let's backtrack on that. He's always been wonderfully supportive and helpful and in some, in some cases in dire situations has helped out. 
library because Ed had told me, go down by yourself. Don't try to advise a student or take care of a student when you're there. Just go by yourself and get, it, get yourself going. Wonderful advice. Right? And then in 74 and 75, I started bringing students and postdoc. <laughs> well, he was doing voltage clamping, and he had recently been through, he was in the middle of a divorce. But I didn't know that at the time. I just thought that he was kind of a cool guy, and I didn't know if he was married or not married or what. I just had to get out my spies to find out, right? And I found out later that he also was, had his eye on me because I was single, and I was also kind of interested. I was an electrophysiologist, and... So um, we, I was in a lab where he spent a lot of time coming over to the lab to, talking, to talk to a, a common friend named Joel Brown. And his you know, visits to the lab would increase. And then from Joel Brown, I found out that John was available. He was already dating other women. And so <laughs> then, as, I as we described in his autobio that's on the Society for Neuroscience website, we started this little game that happens here. So when does he check his mail? Maybe I can bump into him in the mail room, you know? And, oh, I think he has a sailboat. I wonder if I could persuade him that I like sailing and I could crew for him. And where does he, where, when does he go to the yacht club? And that kind of thing. So we, in the end, uh, I think the final moment was when he, when I lost my keys out by Garbage Beach, and he was out there, and he wondered what I was doing wandering around looking in the grass and everything. I, th I think I've dropped my keys. So he went off to find the, the policeman, and indeed, the policeman had picked up a set of keys, and he came back triumphant with these keys. <laughs> and it was kind of like, okay. <laughs> this was one of, the, one of the defining moments that uh, made the relationship come to another level, right? He was my Sir Galahad at that point, bringing me my lost keys. And he felt quite proud. <laughs> Half of my, my life, my social life, my friends, my, my need to, to do science, to teach science, to all of that, and half of it is here, maybe more than half. Because at UNC, unlike when I was at Harvard, at UNC they did not particularly look upon my coming up here with favor. So it was thought that I was coming up here to sit on the beach for three months and they had to t do the summer teaching that had to be done down there. So it was not, not looked at well. Um, but for the MBL, to the scientific community, it just has to it has to be here. It is, it's like, what would music be without, without Aspen and Tanglewood and these other places where musicians go to renew themselves and to inspire the younger generation? You know, it just wouldn't, it, it, music would be, would have a huge loss if they didn't have these places. Well, so I made a number of advances uh, with um, studying the, the photoreceptor, some of which laid out the pro problems that still are problems. So I didn't make any kind of amazing discovery that, that just solved the problem, boom, right? My husband did. He found tetrodotoxin, which blocks sodium channels. It just solved the problem, boom. What does TTX do? It blocks sodium channels, boom. And now everybody uses TTX and they even forget who really made that <laughs> initial discovery. But I think that the thing that, in the end, the two things that I will end up having had most, been most proud of other than the Satellite Club is the Neurons in Action software that my husband and I put together starting in the late 90s. It had its debut in the year 2000 and then we got funded to do a new edition of it, a new version of it in 2007. And when we looked, when we found out that the Dalai Lama was using our program to teach neurobiology to his monks in Dharamsala, India, 
I think that it was a most amazing, amazing moment. And we found that, you know, it's being used all over the world. This was wonderful. And the, I guess the other thing that I'm quite proud of is starting up a class in presentation techniques at uh, UNC uh, and having it spread out to a number of other locations, yeah, kind of as, as the model. Neurons in Action. It's a program that allows you, by s doing simulations with a computer, it allows you to understand how nerve cells work, how voltage is spread in nerve cells, how they get from one end to the other, um, how do they, how do they in invade uh, when, a, when a neuron branches, what happens to the voltage if it's moving along, does it stop, all these sorts of questions about voltages in neurons are questions that interest basic neurophysiologists because that's the signal we use. That's the signal. That's how we get information to go around in the brain from one neuron to another. It's using these voltage changes. The big ones are called action potentials. The smaller ones are called synaptic potentials or uh, other, other names for these potentials. But um, we were able, we, we made a simulation program, a series of about 20, I think it's 28 tutorials that allow students to progressively understand this rather arcane and difficult subject by themselves specifying parameters and see what happens. So it's, a, it's sort of like uh, they ask questions, they say, what if I do this? And then they try to think, I think based on what I know, I think this is what will happen. And then they run the simulation and they say, oh, no, that didn't happen. So I guess I've got it wrong. Let me go back and think about this. Or let me explore these links that we have in the tutorial that tell, tell the student where they went wrong and exactly what the situation is. So it's a very um, deep, it's, it's deep through its links to explanations and other material. It's like a three-dimensional textbook. And the, and the top layer are the, is the simulations that you run and under your own control where you specify parameters and then see what happens in the neuron. So it was a lot of work. I threw myself almost completely into it um, for about, well, I would say it was half into it starting in 1998. And then when, the, when we got the NSF grant to make the new version in 2004, I was completely into it all the time a huge amount of work. Absolutely. Because when you teach, students ask questions and maybe you can't answer it. Maybe you have to think about that again. Maybe it even makes you have an idea to take back to the lab. It's interesting that even, so I'm, I'm an amateur cellist, so I read about cellists. Even Casals, the most famous cellist of the last century, said that he had to teach as well as play because it made him realize every day what he, what he was doing as he played the cello. I mean, it's the same thing, I think. You have to explain. You don't really understand something until you explain it. In some ways, I've always thought that we professors are a little bit um, selfish that way. We give lectures instead of asking our students to give them. Because we, want <laughs> we realize that we don't understand it until we explain it. Then we explain it. But you know what? They don't understand it until they explain it, right? I'm very blessed and happy to have a lot, to have a wonderful assortment of what I call my academic children. But they are both male and female. Interestingly enough, two of them <laughs> just checked in with me over the past week, males. And a male from the, um, first the spines course and then the developmental course last year was at a course in Cold Spring Harbor in June, and uh, at the end of the course, suddenly appeared here and stayed with us for three days. <laughs> it's that kind of wonderful thing.
but I have equal number of fem female academic daughters that um, I'm just, well, Jen Morgan, I would classify as one. So I, I feel that I, uh, you, you ask about, because you're asking what advice I would give to a, a woman in science, but I have to say I, I would, it's an advice to either a, a woman or, or a guy, that, you know, it's become difficult to do science in America. It's not difficult to do science in China or in Korea or in Singapore, but in America, it's become difficult to do science. It's not well funded. It's not well respected. There are lots of restrictions having to, that have been brought about by the uh, animal liberation movement, and it's just difficult. And if you have a passion for it, you should absolutely go into it. And if you don't have the passion for it, then you should look for some other way to do it other than becoming, say, a principal investigator and having to run your own lab. And, you know, you can do it in many different ways. Oh my lord, I mean, you, should, you can do outreach, to explain science to the people of this country, for heaven's sakes. There's a, I'm gonna say male, who just contacted me, I'm gonna have lunch with, um, who is very interested in how, what path can he take to explain science to the people of this country. He doesn't want to be a PI. He wants to get people excited about science so that they won't be so clueless as it seems that they are, many of them. So there are these many, many paths that one can take um, other than running your own lab, which is very, which has become, which has become arduous because of the funding climate. <laughs>